Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from a trio of thrilling countries in Europe. I'm joined here... Hello. And Cara. Hi. And I'm your host, Fen, and today we're just going to be talking about one game, Uno, in single game, uh, Oathsworn. Uh, walk you through our format we're going to be using to avoid spoilers right after the last standy catch-up. So you weren't here last time. What's been up with you, Alessio? It was uh, pretty big news. Uh, I got the base version, so I, I will talk about the standy version of the game today. And that aside, I started playing Carnegie, which is a heavy, heavy Euro game with very beautiful... Uh, I already love it, but I have better impressions when I can put under my sleeve a few games. So that's mostly it for now. I, I came back from vacation, so I'm here pretty relaxed. Actually, my brain is actually... <laughs> I'm here pretty relaxed. Actually, my brain is actually <laughs> fried again because there's a lot of work, there are a lot of games to play, which is always beautiful. And that's basically me today. So, what about you, Cara? Uh, well, I. Uh... Me today. So, what about you, Cara? Uh, well, I uh, just. Yes. The day, the day before yesterday, I came back from my vacation, my first vacation in a decade or so. Um, Gotland is a really nice island fan. Um, Gotland is a really nice island fan. <laughs> yep, yep, there's a reason it's beloved for tourism. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Um, yeah, so um, I spent the last uh, two days kind of, you know, uh, tidying up, getting things in order, um, uh, tidying up, getting things in order. Um, I updated my uh, board game list, which was a bit of a shock um, because my last um, known status was that I have played almost all of my games. I have played almost all of my games. And now that I actually, the first time in four months or so, updated the list of games I own, I noticed, oh no, I just forget, <laughs> forgot to add a lot of games. So um, yeah, my pile of opportunity games. So um, yeah, my pile of opportunity grew a lot <laughs> today. <laughs> so yeah, um, and um, tomorrow I will probably scratch one of those games off of the pile of opportunity, namely Blood on the Clock Tower. Um, as well. So it will be a small group, I think like seven or eight players. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I just want to say that I appreciate how you call a pile of opportunity what I call shelf of shame. <laughs> it's, the, it's a shush -sh. So. <laughs> Unless you call your floor your personal shelf, in which case maybe you need more shelves and perhaps you need to consider your cleanliness habits. Uh, you know, it's a, a pile of opportunity or I'd call it a pile of promise. So it's like a stack of shame. All right. So, uh, Fen, how about you? Well, um, I just finished, like, you know, dealing with one of the most demanding house guests I've ever had. It was an absolute nightmare, <laughs> I can tell you. Just terrible. They used my bicycle, they used electricity, they did all the things that guests are supposed to do when it was just, which is not true. Cara was um, very, uh, very welcome and is welcome to come back as well. Uh, so there was that. Um, on top of that, all of that, the really cool stuff is I got the minis for Tokaido for the Matsuri expansion. So my col collector's edition... Col collector's edition yes my collector's edition is now actually a complete collector's edition Hooray. But, but that's old news from our discord no <laughs> what's on the discord is is not really like we, we don't sit here and read out what's in the discord uh, people are fall asleep if we did. so discord uh, people are fall asleep if we did. so this is news this is a podcast and we talk about news and don't make this news some more 
Okay, in correct. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, additionally, thanks to a nice chap in Greece, I got a few of the book promo investigators for Arkham Horror. Uh, book promo investigators for Arkham Horror, um, which was great. Because they actually have, not just that they have different artwork, which is nice artwork as well, but they actually have different weaknesses and um, unique cards. So there is a play style difference to them. Uh, like them. Uh, like, you know, so that's nice. And I got Gloria, finally. So that was, she's busted as heck, but whatever. Um, and yeah, uh, of course... The reason we're talking is that Oathsworn arrived, and I'm waiting for my waiting for my uh, my stuff from Garfield Games to come. It's arrived with you already, Kara, I believe. Yeah, yeah, it did. Mine's not due to arrive for at least another week for some reason, but whatever. It is what it is. Uh, that's mostly it. Apart from that, we are just at the mostly it. Apart from that, we are just at the end of a heat wave. We're due torrential downpour tomorrow and the day after. Can't wait. Looking forward to it. Um, just be, be like just growing up back home where it just rained every weekend. Fantastic. <laughs> mm. So, yeah, that's that's mostly all of the important stuff. That's that's mostly all of the important stuff. Uh, Pam's been heartbroken since Cara left. Oh, no. She Yeah, well, she, she's, she wears a heart on her sleeve. You know, she's a very... It's a very barky dog, and she can come across as aggressive when you first meet her because she doesn't understand how to say hello to people properly. She doesn't understand how to say hello to people properly. We're trying to teach her, but it's hard when you've got a... You never had the dog at a puppy stage. So, mm. but, uh, you know, as you see, once once you get past that, she'll sit and watch you eat breakfast outside <laughs> or, or, you know, just stare at you. Uh, yeah, so she, uh, she spent a bit at the guest house door just willing you to come out but uh she's she's settled with that now she's i think over it uh but she'll probably be very happy to see you again just the same as she'll be very happy to see my parents and um my other guests i had over from the uk she just falls in love with everyone i mean she's a lovely dog um, oh she is and it's, uh, I, I that's maybe a tip for for all dog owners um i think it's pretty easy to get along with almost any dog as long as you know what to look out for so as soon as i knew yeah that's the way she greets um i was fine with it you know um yeah <laughs> yeah yeah she had a, a rough day yesterday because we were the car was called in for a bit of like a recall adjustment nothing major but we you know we have an electric hybrid car um basically an electric car and it needed a couple of adjustments so we sat around uh, and she gradually got more and more stressed with it until the point where she was just barking at people for walking by and I was just like these poor people are going to think she's a terrible dog and it's like it's just because she's completely stressed out of her mind and we can't take her out of the situation because we're stuck waiting for our car but still such is the case car but still such is the case and um well, we should get on with the actual game itself. So, format we're going with here is Oathsworn's very much a game about mystery boxes and surprises and unfolding stories, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Um, there's a very big deal made about it, uh, even to there's a very big deal made about it, uh, even to the point that when you get the game, you'll either receive a bunch of mystery envelopes or mystery boxes that contain all of the details. And it tries to hold as much information from you so you can enjoy exploring the mysteries you go along. So we're going to start off by talking about everything that's like not a, by talking about everything that's like not a spoiler. So that's pretty much like the characters, the rules, the the sort of the overall setting, um, the physical components, the mechanics, and all that stuff. And then we'll warn you when we're going off into spoilers, and we're going to separate each section by chapter each section by chapter so i'll be like now we're going to talk about chapter one and there'll be everything contained about chapter one in there and then like chapter two will just be chapter two plus you know we might reference back to earlier content we've already talked about but we won't provide any spoilers going forward so if you are like going forward so if you are like oh i don't want anything spoiled cool we're not going to do that for you 
Um, you can stop listening whenever you want to, and then please come back and finish listening once you've caught up. Additionally, we're only going to talk about the first seven chapters. That's enough to, that I had time to play with while Kara was here. Um, to uh, stop since, and we're going to redo it with the story mode to properly do it. And we, you know, I'll talk about that in a moment. So we're not going to rip, spoil anything after chapter seven at all. Um, and that, that's more or less the concept. So. Let's get into the game itself, and I'll start with a little four-player cooperative boss-battling adventure game. It's like Kingdom Death mashed with Sleeping Gods and Seventh Continent. That's what I kind of call it as, um, with a lot more leaning on to like, storybook game and boss battle. It's, it's very much its own thing. It's grim fantasy. Um, there's definitely some Warhammer influences in there, but there's also a whole load of other, like, I'm pretty sure, like, Pullman's works are uh, referenced as well. Uh, a lot of fun. So, overall thoughts? How do you guys think? Okay, let's start with this. Um, well, I have to say that this game is actually, uh, of course, beautifully made. It's... Uh, it shows that a lot of care has, has put uh, into it and a lot of effort. There's maybe a bit of naivety is put uh, into it and a lot of effort. There's maybe a bit of naivety uh, here and there, but we will talk about that and it's absolutely not, uh, not harmful at all. Uh, the game is... Uh, uh, you, you talked about uh, Sleeping God. The game is uh, uh, you you talked about uh, sleeping gods uh, uh, i kind of agree and kind of disagree uh, a lot of people when this game came out uh, uh, talked about uh, the the fact that the story could be on rail the fact that the story could be on rails uh, meaning that uh, uh, the gameplay is like uh, uh, you have a chapter, in this chapter you play a story phase, then you go to an encounter phase. Uh, in the story phase uh, you actually do uh, a few things which we encounter, and a lot of people said, uh, well, since you are going to have that encounter anyway, uh, the story is probably on rails. Uh, a lot of comments have been done uh, about this, I have to say, after playing it, I am nowhere near completion. I, I went up to chapter now, story mode, so uh, I'm about halfway. Uh, I have to say that the story is a bit on rails, yes. So, uh, basically, um, the, the fact is, if you already played the chapter and the story, there's no way you can perform bad. So, uh, it's true that the story is uh, a bit guided. Uh, you have multiple patterns, uh, they are beautiful, the story is beautifully narrated. My point is that it's uh, actually not important that the story is on rails, because the story is good. Actually, the story was half the reason I backed this game is on rails, because the story is good. Actually, the story was half the reason I backed this game, and I am happy of how it's written and how it how it plays, it starts slow, it gives you time to to get accustomed to the world, to the world building, to the setting, and then a lot of stuff. To get accustomed to the world, to the world building, to the setting, and then a lot of stuff happens. It's beautiful. And that's my opinion about this in general, actually. <laughs> yeah, I would still say um, that the whole framework of saying it's like... Uh, um, like sleeping gods uh um like sleeping gods is that it uses a storybook like oh just, yeah ju just yeah. like fighting fantasy and those kind of things um and to be brutally honest by its very nature the same with open world games they are actually kind of on rail if you're not procedurally generated which is very difficult to do uh that yes the narration is fantastic it's james cosmo who is a <laughs> a long standing brilliant actor uh he is jaor mormont yes from game of thrones yeah yes that's one of his less important roles but the <laughs> most one of his most recent so yeah well he's just it's just great narration really really good narration which is important 
Uh, I'm. It's been a while since I've played a narrative based game where I thought, yeah, they've they they've got a good person narrating, and they did here. Yeah, East Stone is actually. Oh, Kara, what are your overall thoughts on the game? Um, so I, I can't comment on the uh, narration. Um, I haven't heard it, and um, also not on the story mode. So um, we only played the instant action mode. We only played the instant action mode, which should be called mostly instant. Or, or, kind of instant mode yeah. but um delay addiction mode <laughs> it's it's really not instant yeah. <laughs> um, um i'm somewhat torn i enjoyed playing it overall um i did not like how the story portions of did not like how the story portions of this instant mode went. Um, I, I didn't. I mean, uh, yeah, it's the instant mode, but um, I felt like th that was really railroaded. Yeah, basically, uh, it says, "Oh yeah, you just this, and now you have." to choose between these two options and no matter what you choose it continues the same way and um so that was kind of okay and then you had rows in between which could really screw you up because you could lose hit points in the story mode uh, in, in the encounter and thought okay that's just because of a bad dice roll now um so that was something i definitely did not like i also did feel like the setting didn't really open itself to me. Um, I, I had a vague idea what this iron road is they are, keep talking about. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, maybe in the rule book, there's like a general introduction to the setting, but if you just start with the instant storybook, you have a actual introduction in the first paragraph, but it's true. Uh, I know about the wire road because I back at the Kickstarter and there were a lot of lore beats uh, by Paul De Stefano, the writer of the story, and uh, one of the main writers of the story, uh, and the creator of the setting. Uh, I think that I did not catch any further reference to that in the story mode, except, of course, uh, fi uh, it's spoilery, so I won't tell that. But uh, no, 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 you, you don't get any glimpse about what is the world, except at the first paragraph and in the third or fourth chapter, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, um, kind of thrown in and... Uh sink or swim um but yeah the encounters i really liked they were, they were very varied so far and i'm sure i would want to pay the amount of money it costs and this is very interesting because actually i have the op the opposite uh, uh the opposite impression of the first Kickstarter, actually, because uh, I got the $99, which for the amount of stuff that's there, uh, uh, think of it like, uh, I don't know, this is a very long game, and uh, once you know the story, uh, replayability maybe would be a bit hindered, maybe you will want to play, uh, sing about it when we talk uh, about encounters. Uh, the the replayability is what it is but basically when you play this game you have played something like a pandemic legacy uh, pandemic legacy is actually now 85 dollars for 99 pandemic legacy is actually now 85 dollars for 99 you get a lot more so uh, i kind of disagree i understand what you say you are right in a in a lot of stuff a lot of things but uh, i think that is actually pretty good value for the money a lot of things but uh, i think that is actually pretty good value for the money 
I think I have to agree in respect to the core game. It's definitely very good uh, value for money. Um, you get hips plastic characters and you get standees for all of the encounter monsters. You get standees for all of the encounter monsters you'll face along the way. Uh, that's very... like I, I looked at just the box. I went, okay, if I just got in the core box and none of this extra uh, chrome and bells and whistles... Is, would have this been a good deal? And I was like, yeah, um, as a uh, somebody, yeah, um, as a uh, somebody who's a painter and likes having miniatures, um, then, you know, if it had just been standees, I actually would have been fine as well, because uh, I think the standees are quite nicely done. I, I did get the standee edition, um, so I got standees and the actual models, and the actual models. Um... Yeah, so I do think the core game itself represents very good value for money. I, I'm i going to... There's two boxes I don't think are very good value for money. Um, one of them is the terrain box. Money. Um, one of them is the terrain box. Um, the terrain has some nice walls and some kind of ugly buildings which they're okay but they're very big and they obscure visibility a lot and then um some very ugly trees like very maybe i just put all the terrain box away and i pull out the cardboard tokens because that may look nicer um but we stuck with it so that's one that i i don't think is a good good value for money akara yeah i i was always happy when a terrain got removed yes <laughs> yeah 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 yes yeah, so, like 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 yeah especially like the buildings just obscure so much visibility and some of the models just collide into the trees whenever you try and move them around that happened a lot in chapter three in particular um a lot of collisions between models and uh so i i would say you could probably you could definitely live without a terrain box. The other big miss, I think, is the armory box. It's a lovely idea. Do not get me wrong, and the engineering is absolutely fantastic. But there's some there's some issues with like like switching stuff back and forth. Uh, if you're going to play with unpainted models, then why would you really care about being able to swap the weapons? Secondly, generally you're kind of like swapping an axe for a hammer that doesn't really look like the picture of the actual hammer you've got and if you get unique weaponry um like very special stuff generally from um like very special stuff generally from a specific encounter then th there's just no sculpts for it whatsoever uh, on top of that uh i'm the penitent and the warden are fast hovering towards me considering gluing them uh, now the reason is is the penitent and the warden are both. Uh, now the reason is is the penitent and the warden are both their one-handed, or one-handed weapon and shield, or two-handed. Now the shield arm on both of them, and this is the only place where this has happened, right? All of the other things are well done, um, but they they they're designed to be detachable and swapped in and out, and there's a consequence and swapped in and out. And as a consequence, they have a gravity-based pin system. So they have long pins that go in and they sink inside the model at a diagonal angle. So if the arm outside is pulling down away from the model, it's pulling against the model itself. It's There's a video on it on YouTube. Uh, I think it's Jamie who... Or video on it on YouTube. Uh, I think it's Jamie who... Or whoever it is who's designed the models talks about the engineering in it. And it's a really impressive piece of engineering. It blows Kingdom Death's multi-part survivors out of the water. No wonder they're going away. Um, but to get back to the point, the Penitence and the Warden both have a shield arm. To the point, the Penitence and the Warden both have a shield arm. The shield arms are like the heaviest arms you can get on a model because it's one arm holding a big like piece lump of plastic. And they have horizontal pins that are about half the length they need to be. So as a consequence, the Warden and the Penitent, who we are playing with, were constantly, you know, I glued the torsos together. They were still, like, major risks. When I switched them to holding two-handed weapons, that went away. It all clicked together well. Uh, but, yeah, I, I just... Ultimately, I was looking at this armoury box, and I was like, if I paint these models, if I actually have the time to paint them, that means I have to sit down and I have thick degree to take into account stuff swapping back and forth. 
That's a lot. Some people may be perfectly happy to do that, but the speed that I can paint at and the limited windows in which I can paint in these days, I just, no, I just don't have the time for it. So that's the armory box I don't think was worth it. What happened, I don't think I was gonna ha be happy with that box. I want to say another thing about the armory box, which is once you swap arms, you cannot put the miniatures back in the insert of the core game. That's also bad. <laughs> Yeah, they don't fit into the vacuum formed fit into the vacuum formed wells. The armory box has four. Uh, it has a whole tray with four big rectangular deep wells where you just put, supposed to put the miniatures once you've changed them. Um, so you could get away with just transporting the armory box around if you were taking it to a friend's house to play or whatever. But considering friend's house to play or whatever, but considering how well everything fits into the core box. Um, I, I, I don't see the point. So that's my advice to people who are going to reback this when it returns to Kickstarter or to back it for the first time. Probably back it for the first time is a better way to describe that. Uh, think very carefully. Better way to describe that. Uh, think very carefully if you want the terrain box and the armory box because that's a lot of shelf space they take up. And I don't think they add much in the way of value to the experience. In contrast, though, I do think the miniatures absolutely do. Um, the whole design, um, the whole design of the two mystery boxes you get, that everything's like nicely numbered. You pull it out and you pop it down, and then hand it to someone to open up. And the inside is a well done plastic insert that protects the model. Um, it's it's a bit of an event. I have, um, it's it's a bit of an event. I have one here because I have the first chapter monster downstairs with me. Um, and it's it's really well done and I think more fun than opening an envelope and get the standees out uh, but that still has a bit of that mystery box fun to it as well the sculpts well the sculpts of the monsters are varied um, I will talk a little bit more about some of them in detail uh, when we get into the various chapters um, but the, there's no doubt the scale of them is really impressive. Like they are, the scale of them is really impressive. Like they are, they're big. I mean, the models are all big. They're all big in the way I think they should be. But the, the, the encounter creatures can be massive. Yeah, uh, one thing uh, to, to tell people who have never saw a Hot Sword Mini, just tell people who have never saw a Hot Sword Mini, just have a look at it. They are on a 45 millimeter scale, so basically uh, 10 millimeters more than a usual model scale. Yeah, and that's, that's just in height, so if you want to try and visualize yeah, and that's, that's just in height, so if you want to try and visualise that, imagine your normal standard Games Workshop Mini, and then everything is about 30% bigger. Yeah, up, left, right, all of it. Um, this is a scale I have said for a long time that I think boss battling games should go for. It's than a dozen miniatures on the board at a time. So make them impressive, make them stand out, make them very distinctive and easy to recognise. Which, you know, i got to say, the models, from a technical standpoint, are all brilliant. And I really appreciate how distinctive the silhouette of each who um, are somewhat similar when unpainted. But all the rest, like, incredibly distinctive. And all of them are very characterful. And the, smallest, and, and the smallest is always the witch. Uh, yeah, I... I'd say the ranger is actually quite small as well. I and my partner played with the penitent, the warden, the Asuras warrior, and the huntress for most of our run. I've also since played a little bit in the first couple of encounters with the harbinger and the blade and the ranger and the cur. So I've I've had a bit. Of cur, the the witch, the the priest, and the penitent. Uh, after some events later, I swapped the the priest with the Ursus, and I kept using it. Uh, I am about the Ursus, and I kept using it. 
uh, I am about to get to a certain chapter. When that chapter comes, uh, I will probably swap in the ranger and uh, and and another character. <laughs> it's actually not a spoiler, but uh, I uh, and and another character. <laughs> it's actually not a spoiler, but uh, I'll keep it because uh, people could not know about the chapter actually. So uh, at the moment I played uh, these five character and I began studying the ranger, but uh, these five character and I began studying the ranger, but I am not yet proficient with that. Yeah. So for listeners who are not familiar with Oathsworn, characters can be played in one of two modes. You can play them in a companion mode or a full mode. Now, the first handle is companion in a companion mode or a full mode. Now, the first handle is companion mode. This is very much like your traditional dungeon crawler style of play. They basically they have two actions in a turn that they can play um, and you can spend an action to move up to four spaces or attack or do a special ability. They'll or attack or do a special ability. They'll have two special abilities per encounter that you'll choose at the start. And it's all referenced on a nice little card, keeping it together in one place. So they are, they're very simple. I actually think they're simple enough that you could hand those characters to younger players and they could hand those characters to younger players and they could engage with the game. No problem at all, as long as they're fine with the themes and the creepy monsters and everything, which let's face it, a lot of kids are kind of cool with beating up scary monsters. It's, it's cathartic. Um, I mean, I mean, they are very powerful. They're very powerful. I, I, they are very powerful. They're very powerful. I, I revert, sat down and I took a look at the penitent to figure out what was going on. I realized that level one, the penitent has like the two most powerful abilities that the full penitent can have, and he, and he has them on cooldown, so he can just use them almost, you know, once, what each one once around. And that's what once, what each one once around. And that's what pushed the power of them up quite a bit which is a fantastic handle for people who look at the full version and go, that's too much for me. It's great to know that you could dip your toe in and learn the game on the simpler version. But also it's reduced load for people who are solo playing. Trying to f- so- solo play four full characters would be overwhelming. Um, and does anyone want to take the field of explaining how a full character works? Huh. Well, um, with a full character, first of all, you have your character board. Um, where you um, have uh, one and the second ability is that uh, their uh, cards in defense mode yield more defense, but that's already on the card. So there's that. Um, and then you can keep track of your might dice on your character board. Um, I'll get to that shortly. Of your cards. Um, there are basically two types of cards. Uh, first of all, you have equipment cards. Um, those are limited by common sense. Uh, of course, you if you have a two-handed weapon card, you can't have any more weapons. Uh, if you have a shield... Four yeah, so cards maximum, yes. Yeah, maximum four equipment cards. And then you have seven ability cards. Um, those have a... A uh, cooldown number or a battle flow number, uh, not sure how exactly it's called. Um, and uh, exactly it's called. Um, and uh, these range from zero to three. Basically, you have one card with zero, two cards with one, two cards with two, and two cards with three. And uh, when you level up and you get additional abilities, uh, before an encounter, you can choose which one's abilities. Uh, before an encounter, you can choose which ones you take, but you will always have seven ability cards. One zero, two t- ones, two twos, two threes. Um, when it's your turn, um, you can look at the cards in your hand, ability and equipment cards, and um, the cards in your hand, ability and equipment cards, and um, play these cards by paying the necessary stamina. Um, or animus um, from your uh, reserve and um, putting them around your character board at the end um, 
putting them around your character board at the appropriate spot. Um, on the bottom there is zero, left is one, top is two, and right is three. So if you play a two card, you put it on top uh, above your character board and um, above your character board. And um, that's basically it at first. You also can spend stamina to move. For one hex you move, you have to spend one stamina. And that is why companions are so strong. Yeah. <laughs> one animal's companions are so strong. Yeah. <laughs> one animal's four movement. Yeah. You, um, you don't move four when you play with your regular uh, character board. <laughs> yeah, because basically at the beginning of each round, everyone refreshes their animus and uh, others were slightly different, but um those are refreshed six animus yeah so that... basically for each turn you have six animus available on average um sure you can keep some over um up to a limit for example the Ursus warware has maximum of nine so humans are always eight of maximum reserve and sixth regeneration the ursus and the, the, the non-humans have nine and the the I think that the AV, uh, the Arbinger, and uh, and the Adendri have seven of its ratio. It's actually pretty consistent. A nice touch. Yeah, there's um, it, you're almost there. So the uh, AV is seven of nine. You know, not a Borg, but um, so, so seven regen, nine maximum, and then both of the Adrendi are. Seven. So you can. Uh, with the user swallower if you kept three over in a turn uh, or in a round next round you'd have nine available but you can't have more so yeah spending four to move is quite a lot of investment um, so and then comes the most important part flow mechanic um, as i said you play your cards around your character board um, at the end of the round um, you get all cards back into your hand that lie at the zero position. Um, so what about my card I played at the two position? Well, as soon as you play a card at position already, move down one. So yeah. if I have two cards at the two position and I play another two card, those two cards that already lay there move to the one position. Yeah, just to correct one minor point, uh, play-wise it feels the same, but the refresh happens at the start of the same, but the refresh happens at the start of the round. Oh yeah. yeah. It's just easy to forget because you don't refresh right at the start of the combat um, uh, if you get ambushed, so it, that's like, yeah. But anyway, everything else, yeah. Yeah, th th there's also the fact that uh, when you... Yeah, th th there's also the fact that uh, when you battle, uh, the action of moving the cards uh, counterclockwise, I think Widershins is uh, <laughs> is called the battle flow. When you battle flow from position zero, you get the cards which are in position zero, right in zero, you get the cards which are in position zero, right in your end, right then. So you can play them again. Uh, for instance, uh, a thing that Witch does is to spam Fireflies. <laughs> fireflies, Elemental Infusion, Fireflies, Elemental Infusion. You can do that once because you have only Fireflies, Elemental Infusion, Fireflies, Elemental Infusion. You can do that once because you have only one zero card, which you get at the start of your next turn uh, back in your end anyway. Damn it, I, I, I did not know that. Um, and that's beautiful. It, it was it was in there in the rules explanation, but the trouble is that. And that's beautiful. It, it was it was in there in the rules explanation, but the trouble is that uh, I, as the huntress, and my partner, as the Asuras, were not using it because we were not battle flowing anywhere near as much as you on the warden, and I you were sat on the other side of the table, so <laughs> I kind of thought you were doing it because you were doing so much and you were refreshing. It. I kind of thought you were doing it because you were doing so much and you were refreshing everything so often that. I, no, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. I had a lot of situations where I thought, damn it, if only I could get this card back yeah. this turn somehow. <laughs> 
but <laughs> that, that's it. That, okay. that, that's that's the smart part of the battle flow system uh i have, uh, you have a, a, a very low animus pool so unless you got uh, a, a lot of plus two animus tokens you won't be able to leverage this but once you are around chapter 10 11 it begins to click a lot that's beautiful features several tokens they are your modifiers uh, they are part of the leveling up but i think we will cover up that later because leveling up is brilliant actually uh, the uh, part about tokens is that you get them during the story mode or during the instant action mode or you have them as a bonus we talked about uh, is basically a token which gives you instantly two action points uh, you get them from your reserve so if you don't have them in reserve because you're Animus is depleted, you cannot get them, but of course since you can play tokens at any time, you will just use them when you are, uh, when, uh, when, when you need them. Uh, there is a redraw token and maybe it's important to say that uh, this game has both cards and dice to resolve uh, checks. Uh, yeah. They are basically the same uh, because the probability in the checks. Uh, yeah. They are basically the same uh, because the probability in the end is not quite no. okay. No, um, the, the, with I the decks... just counted the, bla the, the blanks. Yeah. So no, yeah. no, with the decks not refreshing. Like, oh yeah, no, no, no. Immediately. Um, no, no, yeah. The... With the decks not refreshing. Like, oh yeah, no, no, no. Immediately. The... Um, no, no, yeah, th th that's the important part, actually. Yeah. Uh, and that's why you must spend any moves uh, to refresh cards if you need to do that uh, at some particular point. Cards are a deck which is basically three times the faces on die. On die. Uh, so, uh, ex except for this, uh, they are the same. But what happens? When you uh, draw cards, you basically uh, increase the chance of the leftover cards you will draw in later turns. So basically, uh, you can, uh, you will know that in the age distribution, of course, because you'll draw all of the cards, but in a specific moments, since you know that the, there are 18 cards in a deck, uh, there are six blanks, which are very bad because if you draw two blanks during any check, that check is a failure, okay? Uh, so blanks. Now, if you know that there are seven cards in the deck, and you already have already drawn uh, five blanks, you will know that you can uh, draw all of that seven cards and you will not fail because there's just one blank left in the rest of the deck. All yes. This, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, like myself, learned how to card count so you could go to casinos and get kicked out of them <laughs> yeah. for earning too much in blackjack. True story. Um, then... Uh, on a smaller scale, of course, then cards are quite advantageous. Um, I will say we played dice. Uh, we played dice mainly because I didn't have sleeves for the cards, and so we'll just use the dice. But I do have some comments on those after you finish with the, di the cards. Carry on. Yeah, that's that's important, especially with the monster, because you are advised to play cards with the monster. So uh, we will talk about it with the AI of the monster, uh, which will you know in advance most of the time. Uh, that and knowing that the monster uh, has depleted some of the cards, you will know if next attack uh, will hit for a lot or not. Uh, all the same, uh, in this game you can always switch between cards and dice, so actually if you want to take and do it big time, because uh, when, when you draw cards uh, you just uh, have drawn a lot of blanks, for, for instance, you'll know that you will get a critical next time or you will get a lot, a, a very big, uh, uh, you will do a check with very, with very big numbers. So you just begin until you really need those cards for uh, the big check, for the big damage or stuff like that. So uh, that's it because you have a redraw token. The redraw token is a token if you spend it, you can reroll one die or redraw one card. Uh, this is of obviously 
uh, two blanks is a failure and you have a 33% uh, probability two faces on a d6 of uh, drawing a blank and that's a, a, a small design uh, thing a small design quirk i will want to highlight later anyway all dice have the same chances of doing three numbers change uh, I, I understand why this is done, but the highest die really should have had one blank. <laughs> anyway, uh, there are empower tokens. Uh, these are beautiful. Basically, you have uh, dice of four colors like as, and cards of four colors. Like I said, the, the probability is the same, but the numbers change. They get higher. Uh, you get uh, white cards, yellow, red and black. The black are the most powerful, the white are the least powerful. You start with white, you can always decide what to roll, what to draw, and uh, the number in advance, and then you can empower these checks. Uh, how do you do that? You spend an empowerment token and then you can upgrade three times your dice or cards, which means you can uh, uh, go white to uh, black in one uh, in one go because you get one uh, in one go because you get uh, three empowerments on that roll white to yellow yellow to red red to black or you can empower three dice for ex three white dice to uh, yellow for instance so uh, that's basically it for the retro token there's the battle flow token which is very important and so uh, that's basically it for the retro token. There's the battle flow token, which is very important, and it's it's one on the one of the main ways you can get cards back uh, for free because you spend it, and all cards on your player card uh, get battle flown. One cards on your player card uh, get battle flown one position. So uh, you get basically everything that is zero in your end without playing the zero card and that gives you the chance of playing more cards. Uh, there's the... Uh, there's the... the uh, I'm thinking of the special tokens now. Ah, there's the defense token, of course. Defense is uh, very weird but effective. Uh, basically it's a score uh, you used to, div to divide by that, they divided by 4, you get 2.25, which is rounded down to 2, so you get 2 damage. So one point of defense is actually very, very important, and it's the difference between uh, getting damage a lot or getting no damage at all. I have to say, uh, except in the first two chapters, it, I think for the basic tokens, you have a couple of other, uh, a few other tokens. There are status tokens which are inflicted by by encounters. So I won't talk about those uh, right now. And there is the lethality token, which is a mechanic used by Kerr, which l not linearly, I think, geometrically, not even a weirdly increasing empowerment token you get yeah. by playing the Kerr. Yeah. yeah, the the one lethality token gives you one empowered, and five lethality gives you ten empowered. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, you gradually build them with the cur. It's an interesting variant of you ten empowered. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, you gradually build them with the cur. It's an interesting variant on the old backstabbing mechanic that most assassins and rogues have. Yeah, one, two, four, seven, ten. I think it's the progression. Yep, that's exactly it. So uh, that's basically it about counter. So uh, that's basically it about counters, and I already told you the mechanics of how you perform a check. So that's basically it. You you do checks against uh, everything. Even combat is a check because when you attack, you just roll your might, which is when you attack, you just roll your might, which is. Uh, the the dice the colored dice your weapons give you plus all the white dice you want to roll and as usual if you roll two blanks you fail uh, aside aside for that uh, uh, whatever you roll is the damage you inflict which is divided by the, the defense of your target and that's the damage left uh, one thing I left out is that you can crit so you can perform a critical. Uh, 
one face on each die as a whole face which means that you can uh, just draw an additional card if you draw blank in this additional card it doesn't count so it's a perfectly safe thing to do and when you crit you just increase your damage uh, that's the nice part when you want to roll black die is that the crit for black die is five points of damage <laughs> so that's a lot <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Another nice thing, I I don't know if you did say this or not, but another nice thing is that you get to see how your crits perform before you decide if you want to do redraws or not, which is very helpful. This missed dice here, then I'm going to score this much, and that's going to do this many wounds. I will say, um, the, the, the defense calculation is not too bad, but definitely for people who are not math inclined, you will probably want somebody there to quickly explain... You're dealing this many wounds. I do like two wounds, but if I spend a token because of the multiplicative way that it works, I'm only taking one. Even though, like, say, oh, I've got six defense and they're dealing t uh, 12 damage. Uh, that's two wounds. But if I spend one token, just one, I go to seven defense and now I'm only taking one wound. Uh, uh, brilliant. Really. Yeah, very smart. Uh, you understand it when you get, uh, yeah, when you start taking in 12 damage you understand why it's done like the way it's done and it works uh, one thing important one important thing which works only if you are playing with uh, with a full character when you are attacked you your Oathsworn can decide to before the enemy rolls or draws cards uh, you can decide to discard a card from your end and play it for its defense value uh, each card on the bottom has a defense value written. If you think, important to say that the enemy does not crit and does not miss. So whatever it's rolled, you get whatever it's rolled. Uh, which is usually yeah. in the tens or twenties. So yeah. it's a lot. It uh, is. It, it's, it's nicely done because you have to make, you get to see what they're going to roll. Like, but you don't know what result they're going to get from those dice, uh, which is pretty cool. I did like as well how you some items can be played for defensive stuff, but they don't battle flow. Yeah, exactly. When you play an item, uh, the item does not trigger battle flow. When you play an item, uh, the item does not trigger battle flow. They are most, uh, most assuredly the only thing that doesn't trigger battle flow. They battle flow along with other stuff when other things c cause battle flow, but the items themselves, when you play them, do not cause battle flow. Cause battle flow, but the items themselves, when you play them, do not cause battle flow. Ah, another thing about playing a card for defense, you get that card for defense, you must play it in advance before seeing the dice. Uh, in contrast with the defense tokens, which you can use at any time. Uh, in contrast with the defense tokens, which you can use at any time after seeing the dice, so you can play only the tokens you need. Uh, the card which you discard for defense causes blood battle flow. So it's a strategic decision to keep exactly that causes blood battle flow. So it's a strategic decision to keep exactly that card, even if it has not a high defense value, just because you want to battle flow before it's your turn. Too hard? Too hard? Too difficult? <laughs> No, no, I was just thinking <laughs> it's time for us to talk about the characters and I was just busily sorting them into the complexity order so we can walk through them like that. Um, so just to have a brief talk about them, but also I was thinking how... Uh, just to have a brief talk about them, but also I was thinking how enjoyable the dance that the cards do around your board uh, achieves. <laughs> it is very, very much like a, I think, a dance, the best way to describe it. Ah. I know one of the boards is yeah. upstairs, that's why I'm confused. All uh, right, there we go. So the game recommends, um, the, and uh, it even oh. ranks all of it. Well, uh, I'm sorry, but when you have a character who puts traps down, I'm taking it, like, 100% <laughs> traps on it, my jam. Um, 
So we're going to walk through briefly just to give you an overview of what each one's like uh, based on the tropes. And then if we have city, uh, the most simple of the characters listed is um, the exile. Tide. The exile. Uh, the exile is basically a barbarian, I think is the best way to describe it. Um, he can use like one handed and two handed weapons and wear cloth and leather armor. Um, he won't use daggers, spears. The concept of him is he's exiled from the Scar tribes. Um, so, like, <laughs> whatever he's, whatever he's done to get out of it. Hey, it says it right on the back. He's exiled from the Scar <laughs> tribes. Yeah. It's right here. I could read it, but I'm not going to because it's a lot of text. But each character has a, a video. Uh, no, actually, I didn't, I didn't right. play the exile because it was really too simple. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> difficulty yeah. one is, is is too low. It's really uh, too low. <laughs> uh, I turn my nose up at difficulty one. I'm Alessio. I'm too good for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I'm too good for that. Yes. Yeah. But, but if you if you know, we'll play, and he sells right into that. Then there is the ranger, who in most games would be an elf ranger, but she's not. It's a um, tree. Yes, it's a female a, 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 tree. <laughs> it's basically a dryad. Well, they they are called the A Dendry. Um, she's one of two. She's very much like if you want to play a Legolas law piece that says that they uh, grow their bodies within their own, uh, grow their arrows within their own body. Yeah, they flesh cool. their own arrows. A A A A, a Dendry Dendry. Yeah, like uh, Dendros, I guess. Uh, that's Greek for tree. Yeah. Dendros, I guess. Uh, that's Greek for tree. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're, they're dryads. Um, not hammer dryads, though. Uh, then we got the... Uh, I think there's only one two difficulty character. That's the priest. You said you, you used the priest a bit. Yeah, right? I, I used the priest. I can understand because why it's uh, difficult. I can understand because why it's uh, difficult to Because uh, its ability is to regen one point of health at the end of the turn if he has just three health. And uh, he can uh, heal other characters, healing uh, in Oxworn it's always. Uh, and uh, he can uh, heal other characters, healing uh, in Oxworn it's always. Uh, uh, you give uh, back a few hit points to someone, but you spend hit points in doing that. So it's very useful because the priest is the only character who could regenerate the the. So it's very useful because the priest is the only character who could regenerate the 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 stuff it heals, and it's kind of decent uh, as a tank. He has uh, a way to generate defense tokens. Uh, other than that, he has basically no attack. It's always the same. A way to generate defense tokens. Uh, other than that, he has basically no attack. It's always the second action on his on his cards. So basically, you always do plain attacks with the, with him. If you don't keep it with a shield, he cannot tank very very long or very effective. If you don't keep it with a shield, he cannot tank very very long or very effectively. Yeah. So speaking of tanks, the next character we have is the one that Kara played. That's the warden. Yeah. So, would you like to tell everyone a little bit about the warden, Kara? Yeah, sure. So, um, the warden is a wide range of weapons they can use. They can use uh, two-handed weapons. They can use one-handed weapons with a shield. Um, their abilities um, also are somewhere in between. Like they do have great offensive abilities, but also like uh, taunt ability. You can either play them very offensively or very defensively or somewhere in between. So, yeah. And the um, very char characteristic thing about them is their ability to battle flow a lot because they have uh, one of their special abilities is to battle flow one card and they can use this one set of flow this card over here and then play this card and then this and suddenly <laughs> everything is in place one and next turn i can play a one card and get everything back so um yeah that's something i really enjoyed about playing them and, and they have a very special interaction with the witch Expol, <laughs> you can bounce chain lightning out of it off of it <laughs> Yeah, basically they um, they and however many characters around them uh, they choose 
uh, are immune to the witch's area of effect abilities. <laughs> there, there's a, there's a witch spell which is chain lightning. There, there's a, there's a witch spell which is chain lightning. You basically make it bounce back and forth between the warden and the monster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a, a fun little. Um pre-baked in duo that you can play warden and witch but also quite nicely it turns out the warden baked in duo that you can play warden and witch but also quite nicely it turns out the warden and the witch are both fairly effective played separate from each other which is a good thing uh, there we have everybody's favorite character which is the asurus warbear um, yeah <laughs> warbear um, yeah <laughs> she's very cool she is your traditional gigantic individual with a two-handed weapon um a lot of like strength based abilities she uh, defends for four with a card yep yep she has extra defense baked into all of her cards it's different to the extra defense baked into all of her cards it's different to the way that the warden and the penitent play they kind of have their defense baked into their character with their shield and their armor and then a little bit extra from the cards. She gets to get extra on her cards to make up for the fact that she's not as heavily armoured because she doesn't use shields. She's not as heavily armoured because she doesn't use shields. Which is neat. It's a good way of differentiating the... Um, giving her an active defence, so to speak. So it mechanically does feel quite different. And the most important thing about the war bear. She is very good at destroying terrain. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And not not just not just that. Uh, she can toss toss yes. is pure tribe. <laughs> yeah. She can. It's she beautiful. Can, she, she can pick up and throw civilians as well. If required. Yeah, of course. It's very enjoyable. Uh, then we just mentioned him. Uh, there's the penitent. The penitent is the, like self-flagellation. He's incredibly warhammer. Uh, in, in Terminator well. armor. He has yeah. Crocs Terminator server all over yes. there. <laughs> yes, he has purity seals everywhere and um, and he's busy whipping himself. He, you'd find him in a penitent engine probably in a Warhammer <laughs> world. He is a tank who benefits from healing as well, which is neat. Um, he, I, I, We had him as our companion uh, character. The companion version of him is really a, tough a power he was house, like, yes he was so often nearly the last one standing uh just a co consistent reliable pillar um it just felt like having an enemy group uh, <laughs> i will say one problem um the ma l large extended board is very clear about this it's the same on the warden it says on there that you can't use uh two one-handed weapons can't dual wield the small version of the card the companion card didn't list that so <laughs> there was a bit of confusion for a while of like, so <laughs> there was a bit of confusion for a while of like, uh, what, why is there only like one shield arm or two handed weapons? Um, and it turns out that the, you, in this case, reading the card did not explain the card. Uh, however, the full version is clear about that. Uh, yeah. Um, and then we have the blade. Uh, yeah. Um, and then we have the blade. Um, the blade is basically a... Uh, like a gladiatorial combatant who's fought his way out to the He's Coliseum. He's a World of Warcraft uh, warrior with stances. Well, I was going to say he's not really a World of Warcraft warrior, but sort of, I guess. Well, I was going to say he's not really a World of Warcraft warrior, but sort of, I guess. Yeah, he has a, a stance mechanic which basically, depending on which one of his cards has the most on cooldown, he's in that particular stance. Um, which you can either be boar, viper, ox, or if you have most of your cards in the zero position, it's any. And his card, you have most of your cards in the zero position, it's any. And his cards benefit from you being in different stances. It makes it quite interesting, and you pay a lot more attention to the battle flow of his stuff. Um, uh, he, he genuinely does look like someone like smashed Eldrick and He Man together and stuffed him <laughs> in golden armor. He's incredibly Warhammer together and stuffed him <laughs> in golden armor. He's incredibly Warhammer as well, but more like Age of yeah. Um Then we get on to the other slightly more complex characters. So is. Um, they are in, dif in difficulty four, yeah, there's the AV Harbinger, uh, who is a bird character, who is a bird character yeah um, av it's probably avis uh, from letting the bird yeah avian avian yeah avian, yeah, yeah avis yeah. yeah 
Um, is uh, uh, they are listed like as mysterious in regards to gender. Makes sense. That's what birds are like. They basically look the same on the outside. Makes sense. That's what birds are like. They basically look the same on the outside. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, a lot of a little bit of backstabbing, some kind of like predictive stuff as well. Um, I was originally thinking about playing as the AV Harbinger on our first run. Yeah. And decided against it once I looked at the cards. I was like, I don't really want to be. Decided against it once I looked at the cards. I was like, I don't really want to be predicting what's going to happen in things. Um, but we did see, and I'll talk about it in cha- in chapter two. We had a fun little like interaction moment. It's like, oh, that makes sense. Instant uh, teleportation uh, across the board once. Yes, yes. A good abilities and an interesting selection of loadout weapons. Um, mm-hmm. Then we have uh, the witch, who you played with. Yeah, I, I love the witch. I, I know it's a bit stereotypical, but she has spell. Water and fire, you begin the first chapter with all of one type, but then you can mix. Uh, basically, I, I won't talk about uh, this at length, but she has a lot of cooldown cool one very useful stuff so if you charge a witch with a lot of battle flow and uh, way to battle flow tokens and stuff like that you basically keep playing or with uh, fire if you want to kill the monsters when you know where they move because when you step on fire you get one damage and that's the way you kill basically everything when you know where it will move <laughs> he- it's worth mentioning, uh, as you did, that um, the warden has action. Yeah, th- th- that's also the fact that the, the witch has, has a beautiful thing, uh, which is a firewall, which is basically you put a, a straight line of, f- of five fire tiles in fro- with the center in front of the witch. Then you use some item to get, uh, which get free movements to v- at one end of the stuff where the monster is. Then you use telekinesis to uh, push the monster for or civilians actually you can do that to civilians too <laughs> the, you can use telekinesis to push the monster for uh, actually a number of axes depending on your role so that's basically a way to auto damage stuff uh, there's also one important thing when something collides they get one damage so it's a, a, a nice way to generate damage automatically without having to roll without having to care for to take in account the defense the defense that's yeah. why i like the witch uh, she's uh, she she dr- uh, she she uh, she continues the tr- yes. <laughs> she continues the trend of every dungeon crawling style game since Hero Quest of the wizard magical character being like ridiculous style game since Hero Quest of the wizard magical character being like ridiculously far more complex and potentially more <laughs> powerful than almost everyone else put together. So yeah, um, we I don't we get a little pressed on time, so we're just going to briefly mention um we have the grove maiden who is locked behind story stuff um we have the grove maiden who is locked behind story stuff she's a pet based class my favorite kind of classes and then there's the character i played who's the huntress who has a i think a complexity rating of four or five i can't remember she the board's still upstairs four or five yes yep um she's actually a support slash bow slash support slash bow slash melee slash trapping character where a lot of the benefits are gained if you figure out the best and most optimal set of cards to take to a given showdown. She has a lot of different ways of playing. Um, sometimes she has stuff that's amazing against like big creatures, and then other times she can have loadouts that are fantastic for dealing with lots of guns, though. And she can send the falcons out onto other characters to deal bleeding, or to help friendly characters move, or to drag enemy characters into terrain to destroy it, to get rid of those ugly trees. And um, she, she was quite enjoyable, although I don't know if I want to play her again anytime soon. And the biggest problem was trying to keep her up with bows. Anytime we didn't hit bows, we had to shop for bows. Um, but yeah, so she's definitely the jack of all trades character, I think. The jack of all trades support. Maybe a bard. That's kind of what I like position her as. as, a, as a, how she would contribute, you know, very... To get on to discussing a little bit about the... St- the, the encounters and the story stuff. So we'll start with chapter one, which is the one that if you know anything at all about Oathsworn, 
Uh, you should already know who the monster is. This is the Broodmother. So what's the introductory story section like that brings you to this fight? Brings you to this fight. Oh, uh, well, I'll answer. <laughs> you... Yeah, that's, that's yeah. your part. Oh, okay, yes. You basically arrive at the town of Bastogne. Uh, you arrive through the Y Road because basically the world here is uh, completely de engorged in, in a forest. The world here is uh, completely de engorged in, in a forest called Deepwood, which is a kind of evil trees <laughs> i wouldn't say evil uh, uh, as much as sick trees because they are like corrupted or something like that the only safe kind of safe way to they are like corrupted or something like that the only safe kind of safe way to get from a place to another is to use the wire rod which is basically a rod made of wires uh, on the on the eye branches of the trees which is uh, wires of iron iron uh, is uh, a way uh, is uh, the metal which survives the corruption and the engorgement of the deep wood uh, best so is the way it's used for everything as a coin you arrive in beston you are otsworn so people would who, who have taken the oath so people who want to defend humanity until their death uh, in beston you are charged with finding out why people is dying so you do an investigation. This first investigation is very simple because you are basically told where to go and uh, uh, spoil the puzzles here, even if we are spoilery. So I have just to say that puzzles are, are usually very well done, at least so far. And uh, basically you have to to find uh, the cause of these, uh, of these killings and you will find out that... Uh, People find uh, the cause of these uh, of these killings, and you will find out that uh, people uh, is being killed by rats, and you track the rats uh, through the source, which is in the deep wood, the actual brood mother, which is a big big rat with lots of small rats, which is in the deep wood, the actual brood mother, which is a big big rat with lots of small rats. Yeah, uh, yep. she's the, the fight begins. character. She's the the poster monster for the box. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, it's a yeah, it's a big rat with uh, which spawns constantly. Um, it's a yeah, it's a big rat with uh, which spawns constantly a bunch of smaller rats. So that's the first like slight criticism I have in regards to game experience is it throws you straight into a big monster with minions right from the beginning yeah crowd control it's not a way of playing so yeah it's weird yeah, yeah. yeah. There, 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 I mean, there's some benefits to like smashing the monster into its brood and everything um i so i want to criticize the model for one particular thing on the whole love this model okay full of tons of character um but to the head and the brood rats um so like the body has a texture that I guess maybe the the, the artist sculpting it was like oh this looks a bit like fur, but when you get down to painting it, it doesn't. It looks like bark. So I sat down to have a little like inspection of this of like how would I paint it? If I was really really going to take my time, I'd end up filling in all of the gaps on the fur sections in order to get a smoother surface to just hand paint proper looking fur onto it. So that's my criticism. Is I don't I I think that they could revisit the. The fur on the torso. The rest, of, the rest of the model is gorgeous. The tail is found scaly and, and has indentations and everything in it. And all the little rats look fantastic, really characterful and alive. It's really just this. It's strange because the head has a smoother design and it works a lot better for painting fur on. Um, so this is just one of those things where you have, like, for someone like myself to achieve anything that looks remotely like the standee artwork is almost impossible because of the way it's been done. Encounter itself I thought was quite fun though. Yeah, yeah, Encounter was uh, quite fun. It was uh, 
no, I, I like, uh, I think I, I never felt that I had no chance and uh, it doesn't matter, like Cara said uh, at the beginning, you usually have modifiers in the form of the tokens you get during the, the story phase or you, are, you get uh, uh, maluses uh, like you get, get uh, uh, maluses uh, like you get less HP to start at the start of the fight or you get ambushed and I, I actually we will talk about this but uh, in any case uh, this is balanced you always have a chance and it it happens on every in any case uh, this is balanced you always have a chance and it it happens on every encounter. I think except chapter 6 and chapter 9, I, I never felt like I was fighting something uh, totally hard. Uh, the, the, the counterpart to this uh, totally hard. Uh, the, the, the counterpart to this is now that I know the fight, I think that I can almost perfect it. Yeah, because the monster puts its intentions face up you know what the brood mother's going to be doing and you can put in lead to it a lot of detail we all played kingdom death kingdom death makes a lot of effort in trying to hide what the monsters are doing but gives you tools to figure it out and it turns out when you know what the monster is doing information really does win battles as you know the military would say so yeah yeah it's it's of an intent uh, and, and like attention to it clearly is, hey, look at what this game can do. We're going to kick it off with a bang. And I think it's a good hook to bring it in. And I don't think it's a difficult scenario to win, but it's certainly an encounter to win. It's certainly a thrilling one. And I think there's such as... But you win. <laughs> yeah, well, um, go on. Yeah, I, I also... Um, I just, just realized it when looking at pictures of the model again. Um, it shows there is a lot of depth to it um, because monsters have three phases. I think six or so um, cards, then they get to phase two and then phase three. And they also have triggers when to switch the phases. Basically, if you do enough damage, they will switch to a higher phase. And um, they do have uh, at their hit locations, hit locations that, for example, the, the brood mother. Um, bites a lot so if you knock out its snout or its mouth uh, her attacks become less dangerous and but so you start with this so you see okay she bites so we knock out the teeth and then she it was the second or third phase she starts using her tail and if you look at the model you see that on the tail there are like I don't know like like horns or something so if you look at the model beforehand, you could deduce this tail might be dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's for the second encounter uh, where... But, mm -hmm. whoa, I, I shouldn't have said that here. Yep, yep. Yeah, uh, Alexi, uh, Alexis, Alexis, chance of Bleep this. Alessio, yes, bleep him. Yes. <laughs> bleep, bleep that word. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we actually didn't talk too much about the hit look... Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we actually didn't talk too much about the hit location stuff within the main section of it. Uh, I actually think it's a um, it's a more thematic experience than, than Kingdom Death. You've, I think everyone's one time or another talked about the, but I was attacking the lion's front. Why am I stabbing it in the <laughs> butt? What? Why am I stabbing it in the <laughs> butt? What, yeah. What's caused that? Um, and this feels a little bit more more solid and realistic but uh let's let's go on to what was for me um the low point of the entire experience which was chapter two um <laughs> encounter numbers chapter two um encounter number two um the uh, the, it had the a decent puzzle in the story part because yeah it's what it, it is a red it is a, a simple puzzle uh, like the first one but this one has actually a geometric sense when you, uh, like the first one but this one has actually a geometric sense when you uh, check the locations because you have to do that in a certain in a certain time to get uh, a reward and if you want to get this reward and uh, 
uh, actually uh, you have to fall if you want to get this reward and uh, actually uh, you have to follow a track and that's uh, interesting because it works uh, there are a few things uh, which could be spoiled which actually will solve the puzzle for you so i won't say anything more because uh, the, the only because uh, the, the only pleasure in solving a puzzle is uh, to solve it so <laughs> that's it uh, the fight uh, besides fan <laughs> Yeah, well, you fight against a satyr that is capable of summoning nightmares. Um, it's a big, giant goat man. Your classic uh, big beast man slash minotaur thing. Um, on the model front, uh, most of it looks decent, but the back of the model is it has some really odd details to it that aren't, uh, aren't, aren't great, um, to be honest. I think that part hopefully could be revised in an updated interesting mechanic um but it also uh, well it, it, it basically inflicts like illusionary nightmare type things on players um and this has some fun moments uh, genuinely the funniest moment was when uh, one of the characters the, the bear climbed up the tree um believing that um but for me personally like the fight was uh I, I was constantly stuck on the left hand side of the monster unable to get anywhere near its star farm it kept putting out staff attacks um it kept basically driving people away um and our party had split in two different corners and for me it was pushed away from it yeah it had a lot of hit uh, points uh, and that uh, dragged the fight a lot especially because with reactions you usually get uh twice the actions uh, when you remove a die because you have a one hallucination and then the reaction yeah yeah um thematically quite interesting but uh Cara, did you like it at all um yeah i i also felt it was quite long and the um like these um illusions or or whatever um i thought they were a nice idea but how they worked it felt kind of like a slapstick comedy um like okay hey you suddenly believe this tree is evil and start attacking it and oh you believe you can fly so you do whatever and it yeah it, it, it kind of broke the theme for me i did like and it yeah it, it, it kind of broke the theme for me I did like, however, the text on the "you believe you can fly" thing specifically said the AV AV Harbinger isn't harmed by the drop because they have wings, which was like, <laughs> yes, nice. I like references to classes, um, but yeah, I like references to classes, um, but yeah, not not my favorite. In contrast to chapter three, and I do apologize, we're going to be moving fast through these because we've over talked about the start of the game. So this is just going to be a brief impressions on each of the seven chapters um, with the worm. I had a terrible time during it um, with the worm. I had a terrible time during it. It's I spent a lot of time being smashed against a tree by the worm. But I really enjoyed this one. I liked how the worm had three different segments. I liked how it was a reference to Dune and you could like um, cause vibrations to draw the attention of, of the worm, to draw the attention of, of the worm. And you got rewarded for saving civilians, but you could also save yourselves by making one of the civilians cause lots of noise instead. Uh, it was it was a fun encounter. Yeah, I have just two things to say about this. First is that you could generate vibrations. This first is that you could generate vibrations everywhere except for civilians. And I learned that today. So <laughs> too late to play. I, I made it uh, unnecessarily hard on me. Uh, the other thing is that when I read on the special rules of this monster that it of this monster that it uh, will try to pass uh, to walk around its own uh, board section i thought i have to make this one uh, uh, go around on itself so like playing snake on a cell phone and it was beautifully beautifully fun you yeah. have the scar tribe um Toss, with, toss, toss. Yeah, yeah. So they're there with the, but it's the first time you fight non large monsters. It's when the Asuras can start throwing the Scar tribe at each other, the Scar dudes. 
Um, that was quite fun, and I liked their targeting priority of if you're not going to... He was ambushed in this uh, fight, so they I actually managed to save just seven civilians uh, because the first four were basically killed in front of me. But uh, no, the, there were the, the, the corner section, they were never... Uh, they were never attacked, especially because the fight, we have to say it was refreshing because you draw exactly one reaction in the entire fight. So that part is beautiful <laughs> uh, because there's only one monster with uh, two dice. The other die right away, so you don't draw the last reaction for a monster. Dice, the other die right away, so you don't draw the last reaction for a monster. And uh, uh, it was actually very fun. I had a lot of fun playing space movement and stuff. Uh, I think that uh, the the penitent did a lot of. Uh, I think that uh, the the penitent did a lot of damage there because uh, uh, it was targeted, uh, and in the last turn he yes he had like four empowerment tokens. So yeah. Yeah, uh, it, was it, it, was, it, it was refreshing. It was fun. Like for empowerment tokens. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was it, refreshing. It was it, it was refreshing. It was fun, and it was nice to uh, be able to immediately identify, like, there's a shaman character, they're probably going to be doing some healing, and, and so on. Although we did have some trouble figuring out exactly how the behaviours for this group were going to be at first. It was figuring out exactly how the behaviours for this group were going to be at first. It was... Um, Let's just say, and I wanted to talk more about this when I had the opportunity, but I kind of forgot, but I missed it. The AI card layout in this game is terrible. Oh, uh, really bad. Yeah, uh, no, actually, the card layout is uh, really bad. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, so, actually, the card layout is uh, really bad. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the artwork is good. Mm -hmm. It's actually remembering Boris Vallejo in a lot of uh, impressions, but the, the, the card layout is ugly. Is yeah, ugly, the, bad, and not not really visible. There's not yeah. a lot of contrast. No, the the monster not, not really visible. There's not yeah. a lot of contrast. No, the the monsters have. I I checked. It's nearly thirty percent of the card is wasted on border art and title art, and it's completely not needed. The the back sides of them I like, but the front sides, yeah. Uh, uh, Jamie, if you hear this, go back to those cards. Remove the borders that interferes with it and the font and everything. I just sometimes it just bogged everything down because we could I couldn't work out what's going on and even handing it to other people sometimes it was confusing. Oh, one thing about this chapter actually, uh, if you I don't know if you played the story if you played the fast action mode, but uh, this is uh, you. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, no it but... doesn't really matter. I'd already figured it out because there's a box and you know I was like, ha, ah, that's that's this. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah, so, uh, good fight, enjoyable. Next one, um, chapter five. That's oh, the bloat fly, which yeah, um, the, the the kill the kill the civilians part. Yeah, yeah. Is it not attacking the civilians like the others were previously? <laughs> yeah, and it, it it you can get the logic of what it's doing, but it does feel a bit weird if it's like just choosing the civilians to lay eggs in and then specifically attacking the oath sworn. What what's the logic? How does it know the oath sworn are any different to everyone else who's there? It's the logic. How does it know the oath sworn are any different to everyone else who's there? So it's a bit of suspension of disbelief. This I think was a fun fight, the one where we most tactically played outside of chapter seven. Um, and oh, yeah. we generally pulled the monster into us rather than going to it because it kept attacking and then moving backwards. Yeah, it, it was... Because it kept attacking and then moving backwards. Yeah, it, it was the one fight when I decided that I had enough with the civilians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I read a bit about Jamie in the spoiler section and he's like, yeah, that's intended. <laughs> you, you are supposed to look at those civilians and consider, oh, well, they can... Um, you know, maybe it's better that they got those civilians and consider. Oh well, they can. Um, you know, maybe it's better that they don't survive. Yeah, they, they got my rations for all yeah. the, the voyage. <laughs> yeah, it was the most body horror of all of them. But speaking of horrors, uh, chapter six. Now wow, that I think scary. everyone, everyone I've seen so far agrees. Chapter six. I think scary. everyone. Everyone I've seen so far agrees. Chapter six is where the difficulty like spikes up a bit. You fight three 
horrors i, I think it's just kind yeah. of the name horrors uh they yeah. they have big long tentacle arms and as soon as i saw that i was like they're gonna do some grabbing and dragging and separating people and uh, absolutely and dragging and separating people and uh, absolutely that's part of their stuff they are and wild. you don't know next stage card yeah, yeah, they they hide their next stage card. They keep it face down. It's like playing Kingdom Death without any AI location scouting. Um, and uh, this is the first one where Kara um, and uh, this is the first one where Kara and I had to replay because the first time they just like trapped us in a group after they ambushed us, and we just couldn't get couldn't get apart until right near when things were getting very dangerous, and then they dragged everyone apart, and I think everyone dropped dead in like one turn it was just yeah. like um, i think everyone dropped dead in like one turn it was just yeah. like Boof. yeah it was also, also the first fight when someone died in my in, among my outsworns i am playing uh, that they faint but uh, mm. yeah uh, anyway that was the the first time someone got to zero hp yeah uh, anyway that was the the first time someone got to zero hp yeah it's i, I, I also liked that in all these boss battling games it was the first fight i encountered where this standard system of okay we have to figure out where this standard system of okay we have to figure out who to place where so the right person gets targeted mm -hmm. doesn't work because you fix the targets at the start of the encounter yeah and that's it <laughs> feels like a lot like a hunt yeah, yeah. Although for us, we had a shield wall <laughs> with a hunter, huntress standing behind it. Um, there were, I have read other people with lighter characters ended up running through the trees and using the terrain to delay the attacks. We just weathered the storm. And the second time round, we were a little better with our positioning and it just it worked. And we got them fairly handily in our second try. It was a good fight and uh, interesting creatures, um, lore-wise and design-wise. I definitely say it's one of the highlights, um, for sure. So we have one more chapter we're going to talk about and then just sort of wrap things up. And that is chapter seven, which is when Oath Sworn went full Warhammer. Venerator. Yeah. And that is just a space marine. Yeah, actually, it remembered me a lot of the Purge scenario from Warcraft 3, but uh, I understand the reference. Actually, destroy the houses. <laughs> destroy the houses. Oh, uh, yeah, that that was like the it, it very first. Us and my partner went, I'm going to trash these houses. And we were like, yes, trash these houses. Ha, um, yes, and, and even... <laughs> Even without the Asurus, the Venerator is large, so you can kite him next to a building sometimes and you can knock him back into it with the various knockback attacks you have. And um, yeah, you know, I looked at the chapter discussion spoilers for that and, and Jamie's little, you know, something smart. And yeah. I like as well that not only is there the obvious route of if you have the bear, bear make building go smash, <laughs> bear smash. You also have the extra steps of, oh, we can actually still knock this guy or force him to walk through the buildings to destroy them. So I thought that was very cool. I felt when we started and with the story, I thought like, oh, that's awesome. But the fight itself, it, I mean, it was so simple and it kind of fell apart with destroying the buildings and then just pulling the venerator away from all the deaths pools of dead pools of blood and um, yeah it, it's a, yeah if you li if you leave it cold to arms it's not that simple but uh, yeah i understand it's actually uh, straightforward you know what you need to do yeah it felt to us like we'd cut half the fight off you know what you need to do yeah it felt to us like we'd cut half the fight off and just pushed it away and then we spent all our time in the northeast corner, smacking him around. Um, and eventually he wandered back into the middle and did Blood Rain. Um, but he did that so late that it just wasn't going to take anyone out. And that's so late that it just wasn't going to take anyone out. And um, he he dropped, like, just barely reaching into his stage three. He was gone. So, um, so I can just imagine that fight being really difficult if you don't twig that you need to destroy the yeah. buildings. Yeah, you you must take the time to do that because arts uh, and cult arms is actually it, it can ruin your day. I can 
especially with not with uh, if you are not using companions i can see your action going completely wasted if you leave it go uh, for a long time Actually, speaking of time i think yep. there's no time to talk about chapter eight we, are, we, we, chapter. <laughs> we never got that far anyway um so but i'd already twigged on what was happening because there's only only one board instead of two, so I already <laughs> knew what was going on. Um, but yes, uh, points for me, I think, and we'll each have our quick final points wrap up and then we're done. So for me, uh, I think Oathsworn's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I think it is like the core game is it's close to like a must buy for anyone who really enjoys boss battling games, enjoys campaign games, likes a really well written story. Uh, and all of that, uh, and all of that, but I do think that Jamie needs to go back and take a look at accessibility. Uh, tokens need more distinguishing um, colors. There's problems with reroll tokens, empower tokens, and battle flow tokens all looking similar. You can't glance across yep. the board and see what people have, except for animus and defense, which are very clear, except for animus and defense, which are very clear. Um, and the AI cards really could do with a rehaul on the front. You know, breaking separate actions apart is a a good thing. Yeah, just have a line spacing between each one and get some more space in there. There's there's too much art on the cards. Space in there. There's there's too much art on the cards. I'd like to say as a real nitpick, you don't need the class symbol on both sides of the uh, of the cards that are used. You know, the action cards. You really don't. You don't ever shuffle them up. You don't mix them around. The back is good enough. Get yourself some extra space on the front. Take that is good enough. Get yourself some extra space on the front. Take that class symbol off and make it a bit less busy. Yeah. Um, so the, it's also a table hog. So a lot of mm -hmm. stuff could be a bit uh, condensed, like yeah. ch uh, player boards, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But my complaints to the game are all minor nits, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but my complaints to the game are all minor nitpicks, mostly around based around accessibility, because I had accessibility issues with this, which I've not had with any other boss battle I've played previously. Um, but that, like, that is a personal thing, also accessibility thing, um, thing, also accessibility thing. Um, so that I, I thoroughly recommend the game. It's really enjoyable. My partner really enjoyed it. We're gonna like play from the beginning now and play through the full story. Um, it's been fantastic, uh, and I think just the core game with the standees is good enough that be seriously thinking about backing it when it comes around again. Um, yeah, in and, October possibly. And my final point before I shut up is to say. I love how modular the difficulty in this game is. Choose your difficulty level. You can slide it up and down while playing. You can choose to roll dice. You can choose to pick the card. So many options and it's refreshing to see someone make a hard game, but also be like, and here are a bunch of official ways to play it of different difficulties and different styles. Go, go nuts. So yeah. two thumbs up, nine out of 10. Yeah, it's beautiful how this game, uh, the part which could have flopped so hard, uh, is any way you wanted and it works perfectly uh, a lot of work has been done honing this aspect and it shows uh, i have another complaint but this is because i actually had i i didn't think uh, uh, i had this complaint until i checked on forums that a few of the rules i got wrong and it always happened because there are exceptions a lot of the rules have continuously exceptions and uh, maybe this stuff could be streamlined or a bit of warning box could be uh, actually uh, again accessible uh, the, the exception could be shown uh, with a bit of relevance uh, with uh, they could be highlighted because uh, there, there are a lot of exceptions in this game so it's important to to make them known yep and Kara, final thoughts Final thoughts. Um, I agree with you to to change there. Um, I uh, st still stand at I don't really see the value. Uh, yes, um, like money per material, that's totally fine. But I feel it's kind of overproduced for what it is. Um, it could have 
gotten the more or less the same experience with just you know less and for less money for example i don't know why there are so many characters that's actually something that kind of turns me off because on the one hand i'm a completionist on the other turns me off because on the one hand i'm a completionist on the other hand i could not imagine myself playing this game multiple times just to get the experience of each character um so yeah it's um I mean, even with our six chap seven chapters, I felt like okay, I'm only playing. I mean, even with our six chap seven chapters, I felt like okay, I'm only playing the warden. I would like to see the other characters, but I also would like to see the warden. So, yeah, um, yeah, and... yeah. Very deep characters, a lot of them, and you've got two ways to play each character as well. To play each character as well, which is kind of staggering that they've done all this work. Yeah, and uh, then the core pledge, I mean, it's kind of, it's you have to decide for yourself how you see it. I don't like mixing miniatures and standees. In the first fight where there were uh, civilians, we missed out that there were, was a box with the miniatures in it, and I didn't like it. I, I just thought it looked wrong. So for me, the idea of having miniatures for the characters, but then standees for the uh, enemies doesn't feel right so yeah i have a question for you do you have that same problem with given is currently standees for monsters miniatures for the players yeah and both miniatures for the players <laughs> there will be a miniatures kickstarter for them at some point but yeah i didn't realize you had to play gloomhaven um otherwise we'd probably be comparing to that a bit uh okay but well that is um where i'm thinking i might write some more about it in the future a written review but uh that's probably after i've finished the campaign um so thank you for listening to the last standee you can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last standee or follow us on twitter as the last standees um and you can listen to us and subscribe on your preferred podcast app. So it's a farewell and a return into the forest for Alessio. Goodbye. Uh, it's a nice trip to civilization for Kara. <laughs> Bye. And it's a wandering over, retreading uh, story. Standy is for encounter.